Google Trials. If you're joining us, if you just want to move your, move your mic so I don't have to, if yeah. not, I can mute them for you. But if everybody that's joining could just kindly mute their mics, turn off their cameras. All righty, good evening, and thank you all for joining the First Amendment Museum tonight for, oops, if everyone could just join, just make sure your camera's off. If not, I can turn them off for you. And then make sure you are muted. Again, um, if you're not muted, I will go ahead and just, in fact, I'll just mute everybody now. Um, uh, no interruptions yet until the end of our talk tonight. And then we will do Q&As and we'll have all the time for interruptions and all sorts of sounds. So good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining the First Amendment Museum tonight for What Are They So Afraid Of? Book Banning, Censorship, and the Need to Read with author and historian Kenneth C. Davis. This is another entry of the First Amendment Museum's online speaker series. This is your first time attending one of our free presentations. First Amendment Museum is a nonpartisan nonprofit museum located in Augusta, Maine. I'm Max Nospich, the manager of education and visitor experiences. We rely on gifts from people like you, from viewers like you, to continue to do the work we do. So if you enjoy this presentation, you enjoy this free content, please uh, consider donating to us. I'll get that link in the chat below soon. Also check out our website for future speaker series installments, events, film screenings, along with other great content and opportunities that we have on our website. Uh, tonight I'm joined by historian Kenneth C. Davis. He is the author of the bestseller, Don't Know Much About History, which gave rise to the Don't Know Much About series of books and audios. He wrote about threats to democracy and Strongman, the rise of five dictators and the fall of democracy. His most recent book is Great Short Books, A Year of Reading Briefly, an exploration of 58 short novels and their authors, many of whom have been banned or suppressed. If you have any questions for our speaker tonight, please put them in the chat if you're on Zoom and in the comments section if you're watching on Facebook. Kenneth, thanks for joining us. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Max, and thank you all for coming and checking in. It's a great pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, I would much rather do this in person as we all would uh, like to do more of these events in person and slowly but surely it's, it's happening again. Um, just to briefly uh, add a bit to what Max, Max's lovely introduction and thank you for that, Max. Um, I have been writing about books and history for a very long time. Sometimes I'm boggled by how long I've been doing it. Uh, and these two things uh, mean a great deal to me. I'm a great lover of books and a great lover of history. So tonight's subject really brings together two of my passions uh, as a person, as a citizen, as a human being, but as a writer as well, and as someone very concerned with um, what is going on in the country and around the rest of the world right now in terms of uh, censorship, uh, free expression, uh, human rights, and all of these things that we value and prize in this country. Um, I will put on my historian's hat first and talk a little bit about the history of, of book banning and censorship. And then I'm gonna switch a little bit and put on my author's hat and uh, at my writer's hat and speak a little bit more, I guess, about what I think of as the threats at this moment and why I find them so um, concerning. Um, most of the uh, people who know me do know me for this book, which uh, is called Don't Know Much About History, Everything You Need to Know About American History But Never Learned. Uh, I am astonished when I say that that book was published 30 years ago. It's still in print and it's been revised, expanded, updated many times since then. It is a book that um, frames American history in terms of questions. I was always a curious kid and I asked a lot of questions. And uh, when I set out to write Don't Know Much About History uh, in the late uh, 1980s, it's astonishing for me to even say that. Um, 
It was the time we were really beginning to realize that Americans don't know much about history. And I couldn't understand that because I was always a lover of history. I grew up uh, just outside of New York City in a small town called Mount Vernon, appropriate name, named for George Washington's plantation. And uh, that had nothing to do with my interest in history. I was lucky because my father who was a World War II veteran, uh, had some World War II surplus sleeping bags and a tent, and we would go off on camping trips when I was a kid. That was our summer vacation. And we would go to places like Valley Forge and Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York or Gettysburg. And from those trips, uh, even from a very young age, I had the sense that history isn't something that just happens in books. History happens to real people in real places. And when we treat it that way and talk about it that way, it becomes a lot more interesting than the long list of dates and battles and speeches that most people think history is. I remember very clearly being nine years old in Gettysburg. It was 1963, the 100th anniversary of the battle at Gettysburg. And I knew standing in that field, in that summer field, in that heat, uh, surrounded by those rocks. And if you've been to Gettysburg, you'll perhaps appreciate what I'm talking about. It, it's an extraordinary experience. And I remember feeling that even though I was nine years old and not really sure about what the Civil War was really about, I knew that something extraordinary had happened in that place. And so when I set out to write about American history for Americans who either never learned it right forgot what they were supposed to learn or learned it all wrong in the uh, in the first place. I wanted to give that sense of adventure, excitement, but mostly humanity that I think we leave out of history when we uh, talk about it in school. Um, so that's been my passion uh, for 30 years. The book is written in a series of questions and answers that begin with the very basic ones like, did Christopher Columbus really discover America? And they get a little bit more uh, quirky and irreverent, like why is there a statue of Benedict Arnold's boot in Saratoga, New York? Uh, and if you're interested in the answer to that, uh, we can do that in the Q&A later on. But those sorts of questions always, uh, I think, provoke curiosity, get us to think a little bit more uh, about the stories we may have heard that may not be true. And that's what I've tried to do in 30 years, almost 40 years now of writing about history. Um, and to start off, I, I think uh, it would be appropriate to talk about some history in terms of what we're talking about tonight. And I keep my copy of the constitution nearby. So I'm just gonna read two uh, brief uh, pieces out of the Constitution that I think are appropriate uh, to the subject at hand. Um, and important to remember, people always talk about what's in the Constitution. It's very easy to find out what's in the Constitution. Here it is. Uh, this one is Article 6, which is one of those articles that most people never pay too much attention to it. But the part of it that I'm focusing on is where it says the senators and representatives before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this constitution. That's the first important point. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. No, ever, any. That's the important operating words there. Um, Article six of the Constitution. And then of course, it's very important here, especially in this place, uh, to talk about the First Amendment. So I'll read it to you quickly because many people talk about it, but a lot of people don't know what it actually says. Congress. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Um, these ideas were so important to the founders and to the framers of the Constitution. 
we go back and look at Madison, we go back to the father of the Constitution, we go back and look at Jefferson. These ideas, both the freedom of the press, the freedom of expression, and the freedom from an official religion were really important motivating ideas for these founders. And I think when we talk about the originalism of the Constitution and being an originalist, you have to take that very much into hand. Now, I said I've been writing about history for a long time. And as I said, most people know me for a book about American history, but I actually started my career out writing about books. Uh, and that's why I say this is uh, this conversation really brings two things together for me. This is actually the first book I ever published. It's called Two-Bit Culture, The Paperbacking of America. And it's a history of how the paperback business grew in this country, starting from 1939, when pocketbooks were first uh, 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 published and distributed. Um, it was a true revolution in this country, because in 1939, there were about 500 bookstores in America. Uh, books were a luxury item. Pocketbooks came in and changed that overnight, because all of a sudden, Books were available in drug stores and bus stations and train terminals and stationery stores and the newsstand. Uh, and they were all priced at 25 cents or two bits, hence two bit culture. Uh, and in that book, I wrote a rather lengthy chapter about the history of censorship in this country. And that's why I say this has always been a motivating force in my career motivating interest for me as a as a writer and also as a person who believes very deeply in the ideas of the First Amendment and those uh, essential freedoms. Many other countries uh, have the right to vote. Not all of the other countries in the world, democracies or not, have the right to free speech guaranteed the way we do in the United States. So that's why I think it is so important and unique and more important in some ways than the right to vote. People will always say, well, that's the most important right that we have. Now, I think the right of free speech is the most important uh, right we have. And men like Madison and Jefferson certainly understood that. So the, <clears throat> the history I wanna talk about tonight is really the history of censorship and how that fits in with our ideas of a first amendment, which would seem to rule against any kind of censorship. Uh, censorship is, uh, and especially book censorship, is of course older than books themselves. There are records going back to ancient China of an emperor burning all the scrolls because they didn't like the ideas that were in the scrolls. We certainly have uh, histories of uh, Christians burning pagan scrolls and Romans burning scrolls that they didn't like. Uh, the idea of suppressing books, suppressing information, suppressing ideas is truly an idea that's older than the book itself. Uh, censorship of books, as we understand it in a more uh, sort of formal official sense, really comes about during the uh, Reformation period in Europe, when the Vatican uh, created an office to create a prescribed list of books, books that were actually prohibited and that list uh, continued well into the 20th century. Um, in fact, there are writers in my book, Great Short Books, like Alberto Moravia, uh, a, a wonderful Italian writer who, whose books were banned by the Vatican. They were on the prohibited list of the Vatican. They were also banned by the fascists, and that's a, another subject that we'll get to. In other words, this is a very old idea that people have suppressed books, have suppressed ideas, have suppressed writers, and certainly to the point of eliminating writers whose ideas they really didn't like. 1600, for instance, comes to mind. A man named Giordano Bruno um, did not uh, believe all of he was a priest, but uh, did not, not go along with all the church's teachings, including the idea that the uh, the earth was the center of the universe. He was much more in line with Copernicus, believing that the earth moved around the sun. Uh, Bruno was told to recant this and other ideas that the church considered heresy. He would not. He was burned at the stake in 1600. 
A few years later, Galileo was brought before the same group and put on trial. And Galileo was not uh, not foolish enough to not have known what happened to Giordano Bruno. So he absolutely did go along and recant some of his views to the Inquisition. So this is the the kind of long history of the suppression of ideas that is part of our tradition and our history that we have to acknowledge. Um, we like to think about because the constitution was uh, adopted, framed and adopted in 1787 and went into effect that uh, this set the United States apart. Um, but censorship and suppression of ideas has always been part of the American system as well. Um, I like to say not too glibly that um, censorship of books is about as American as apple pie and lynching. Um, the most obvious and disturbing case in a sense, in a historical sense, was in the 1830s uh, when the abolitionists of the North were trying to send pamphlets, abolitionist pamphlets, down into the deep South, the slaveholding South. Well, President at the time, Andrew Jackson, uh, did not like this idea, and he told the post office to stop delivering these pamphlets, even though he certainly knew that there was a First Amendment that would permit it. And then in 1835, in uh, South Carolina, they actually went into the warehouse where all of these pamphlets had been stored by the post office, took them out, started a barn fire. So the first big massive book burning in America took place in the 1830s aimed at abolitionist uh, literature. They did not like those ideas. So they were going to burn them. They were going to suppress them. They were going to keep them from being delivered or, uh, or published in the South because they did not like the ideas. It was a war of ideas. And that's a, a phrase I'm gonna come back to a couple of times here, the war of ideas. I should point out that they also burned in South Carolina in that, that night, an effigy of the famous uh, abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. But a year or two later, uh, another abolitionist was not so lucky in Alton, Illinois, a group that uh, Illinois being a, a, a northern state without slavery, they still didn't like what abolitionists were doing. So they actually attacked a warehouse where a publisher named Elijah Lovejoy had kept his presses and his uh, all of his papers and his pamphlets. And uh, they tried to burn it to the ground and Lovejoy was killed that night by a mob of uh, anti-abolitionists. Um, I bring up Lovejoy's name because it's not only important in the history of burning books in America, but he's also, um, it's a little local history. Uh, if any of you have been to Albion, Maine, you know there's a Lovejoy clinic there. It's a federal uh, uh, clinic. And uh, Lovejoy actually came, Elijah Lovejoy came from Albion, Maine. So uh, uh, one of the true martyrs of uh, the First Amendment the martyrs of censorship uh, was a Mainer named Elijah Lovejoy. And um, I happen to know this story because uh, I know someone who worked for a time in the Lovejoy Clinic. So uh, I've been to Albion and there's a plaque that um, notes uh, Lovejoy's contribution uh, to the abolitionist cause. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, there was a great change in what was considered acceptable in books. Uh, the slavery issue pretty much had gone away. Uh, there were writings about slavery and abolition that were widely published and very successfully published. Uh, certainly uh, a book like Uncle Tom's Cabin and uh, the narrative of Frederick Douglass were freely published, although probably not widely distributed in uh, the Deep South. But after the Civil War, there was a big change. And the change was not about politics anymore or political ideas. The change was really about sex. Uh, in the 1870s, a man named Anthony Comstock really started a campaign against what he called the vice and the terrible things that were being published in books. 
uh, and he was named by Congress as a special agent who had the authority to go through the mails and stop any book that he thought was obscene from being mailed. This was a whole uh, set of laws giving one man this specific power, Anthony Comstock. They actually called these the, the these rules the Comstock Load. And he really reigned supreme for most of the rest of the 19th century and well into the early 20th century. And he was expressing a sort of Victorian uh, morality, uh, uh, kind of blue nose Protestant ethic morality about what could be published, what could be sold. And this was really to uh, to protect uh, the the uh, the sanctity of marriage and to keep people from uh, heading down the road of sin by reading dirty books. Um, but those books happen to include marriage manuals. They happen to include some of the first birth control manuals by uh, people like Margaret Sanger. Uh, so it wasn't just dirty books or sexy books, but it was ideas, once again, that people didn't like. So we come back to this notion of the war of ideas. Um, Comstock eventually uh, died and the, his uh, powers went away, but the, the sense in the country at the time continued that America was very Victorian, very prurient country, and especially in certain cities, certain books were not going to be allowed. Uh, most famously, Boston uh, had very, very strict rules about what could be published. And publishers began to learn that if your book was banned in Boston, that was actually a good thing because people certainly wanted to find out what was in the book that Boston thought was so bad. So ba banned in Boston actually became something that publishers like to put on the front of their book. Uh, one of the writers that I include in great short books is uh, James M. Cain, uh, really a great uh, uh, proponent of what's called hard-boiled fiction, detective fiction. Uh, the book that's in, uh, in great short books is The Postman Always Rings Twice. That book was banned in Boston, and once that happened, it had tremendous sales all over the country. Um, so that's always been the interesting side piece to book censorship. Uh, around this time, there was a very, very important uh, uh, court decision, and I'm talking about uh, about 100 years ago, in 1933, uh, 90 years ago, 1933, uh, the book Ulysses by James Joyce was banned in this country. It could not be sold. It couldn't be sent through the mails. The publisher Random House and a bookseller in New York challenged that. And in 1933, a New York judge uh, issued a ruling that allowed Ulysses to be sold in America. And I'll just read very, very briefly what Judge Woolsey said in, uh, in that decision. I'm quite aware Ulysses is a rather strong draft to ask some sensitive, though normal, persons to take. But whilst in many places the effect of Ulysses on the reader undoubtedly is somewhat emetic, meaning might make you throw up, uh, nowhere does it tend to be an aphrodisiac. Ulysses may therefore be admitted into the United States. Um, Judge Woolsey's landmark decision did not end book censorship in America. Certainly, it continued well into the 1930s. But as I said, uh, a, a book being censored in a place like Boston almost became a selling point. Things changed 20 years later. And they changed uh, seriously because of uh, Joseph McCarthy. In the 1950s, Joseph McCarthy led a true campaign, a national campaign, to rid American libraries of books that he thought were socialist or even somewhat uh, uh, un-American. Uh, and of course, this is the period of the great fear of the, uh, of the Soviet Union and the Cold War and of communism. So uh, McCarthy went off to anybody who wrote books who might have any connection to Marxism, communism. That included people like Dashiell Hammett and uh, uh, Lillian Hellman, Howard Fast, very well-known writers, obviously, of the time. Uh, McCarthy even dispatched two young men, 
to Europe to go through the State Department libraries in Europe, where they were, they had libraries where they were trying to promote American culture, American writers to Europeans in post-war America, uh, post-war Europe. And these two uh, men started to take books out of the State Department libraries. One of them I will mention was Roy Cohen, who became, of course, McCarthy's chief uh, legal aid uh, during all of those McCarthy hear hearings later on. Uh, during that period, in 1953 in particular, uh, Franklin, uh, I'm sorry, President Eisenhower, President Eisenhower gave a speech and he got up because he knew what was going on with these books being banned. And he said, don't join the book burners. And this was a pretty daring thing. It was, it was at a commencement address in New Hampshire. Uh, it was a daring thing. He had just been inaugurated as president, even though he's extremely popular. It was very, very dangerous to go up against Joseph McCarthy at that time. But Rose, uh, Eisenhower says, don't join the book burners. Don't be afraid to go into every library and take out every book. And then he sort of qualified it a bit by saying, as long as it doesn't offend your sense of decency. So that kind of gave him an out. Um, of course, sense of decency is a very slippery slope. Uh, around this time, uh, it sounds almost ludicrous, uh, a textbook commissioner in Indiana actually ruled that schools would not be allowed to have any books that mentioned Robin Hood. Well, why Robin Hood? Well, Robin Hood stole from the rich to give to the poor. That, she thought, this textbook commissioner, was socialism. So they want to actually purge the school libraries of any references to Robin Hood. It sounds kind of laughable now, but that was a very, very serious time in America where to go up against the accepted norm that Joseph McCarthy was trying to put forth was a very, very dangerous idea. Obviously, this is the time when writers in Hollywood were being blacklisted if they had any connection uh, to communism or socialism. So it was a very, very dangerous time to have these ideas. Few politicians wanted to push back against McCarthy, but one group did, and the group was the librarians. The American Library Association in 1953 issued its first statement for academic freedom in this country. And it's a very, very important statement because uh, it says, we believe that what people read is deeply important, that ideas can be dangerous, but that the suppression of ideas is fatal to a democratic society. And that's where uh, they left it in 1953. Of course, Joseph McCarthy uh, went away. I just want to back up for a second. There's one piece of important uh, history I left out here, and uh, it's again relates to this war of ideas. Of course, in 1933, we saw the greatest, most visible example of book burning in modern history, in a sense, when the Nazis burned thousands of books in Berlin uh, in 1933. Uh, they were books by Jews. They were books by German writers that uh, the, the Nazis didn't like. Thomas Mann, who's uh, in great short books, is one of them. They burned the books of Thomas Mann. They also burned the books of Hemingway. They burned the books of Sinclair Lewis. They burned the books of Helen Keller because Helen Keller was a socialist. Um, so this was the danger of seeing a country that was completely wrapped up in this idea of destroying ideas that they thought were dangerous. 10 years later, in the midst of World War II, the United States did something very different about books. Uh, in the midst of World War II, the, created a, the publishing community came together and created something called Armed Services Editions. And these were books that the publishers were going to agree to give to the army to let them be given away free to servicemen serving all over the country, all over the world. Um, the armed services editions began in 1943, 10 years after the book burning. And it actually was uh, started in a sense by something Roosevelt said. Uh, Roosevelt said, Franklin D. Roosevelt said, books cannot be killed by fire. People die, but books never die. No man and no force can put thought in a concentration camp 
forever. No man and no force can take from the world the books that embody man's eternal fight against tyranny. In this war, we know books are weapons. And in fact, the armed services uh, additions took that, uh, that idea and made it their slogan. Books are weapons in the war of ideas. And I came back to that because I think it's so important to realize, and this is where I'm going to switch tracks a little bit here, to say that I believe we are in another war of ideas. And you've probably seen it every day in the newspapers. I certainly do keep track of this. The banning of books in, not specifically just in Florida and Texas, but all over the country. Uh, it has become a political issue, a partisan political issue that some politicians, uh, specifically Republican politicians, are using as a cudgel. Uh, in Virginia, for instance, uh, during a governor's race a few years ago, uh, the Republican candidate made an issue out of the book Beloved by Toni Morrison, uh, saying that this book didn't belong in schools. And that ad, which attacked Beloved, was actually seen as a very, very influential uh, uh, piece of that campaign. And of course, the Republican candidate eventually won. Uh, so this is what has become a little bit different about book banning, suppression, censorship in our time. I believe it's a much more partisan, politically driven idea that is very, very dangerous right now for our society. Uh, just because uh, there's a little more history here, I'm going to just cite one other uh, element of this story because so many of these book bans and censorship uh, cases that we're hearing about now in Florida in particular, in Texas as well, relate to school books in schools as opposed to just any books that you or I might wanna read. Although public libraries, for adults are being uh, uh, censored and suppressed as well. But mostly the issue is about schools right now. And in 1982, this issue came up before the Supreme Court and uh, the court ruled at that time, it wasn't a full scale ruling that students don't surrender their rights when they go into the schoolroom. And in a case in here in New York, I'm in New York uh, City, but just outside of New York called Island Trees, several students brought a suit because the school had tried to remove a number of books. And the judges ruled that this didn't stand, that school boards certainly had the right to determine what is appropriate for students. But once they got into the area of deciding political ideas weren't acceptable, Polit political ideas that they didn't like, that's when they had crossed the line. So that's where the case stands or the case law stands right now in terms of schools and books. Um, we are clearly at a point where the book banning has accelerated to a dangerous degree. Why do people ban books? Why do people burn books? Well, it's not because of a sexy word or uh, a dirty word, or in the case of Art, Spiegelman, uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, a cartoon book, uh, what was offensive in that book to someone was the fact that there was a picture of a woman's bare breasts. She happened to be Art Spiegelman's mother who committed suicide in the bathtub. Um, Mouse, by the way, is also mentioned in great short books. Um, it is a graphic novel that describes the Holocaust and the idea that this book should be removed from schools uh, where it should be read appropriately by uh, students who are old enough to deal with it um, is to me an astonishing idea. And of course, once Mouse was uh, announced as a book being banned, it simply shot to the top of the Amazon bestseller list, which is a fine thing. It, it, it helped the book. But it didn't help the fact that students now could not have access to that book. Could they go and buy it themselves? Well, sure, if they could afford it or if they could ask their parents to buy it. But they were being denied information. They were being denied ideas. And to me, it's a fearsome 
uh, notion when you get into the realm of denying books that relate to the Holocaust to students. So a lot of the books right now that are being banned, if you've been following this at, at all, um, are very, very specifically aimed at uh, a, a cer certain groups. The books that are being banned right now are predominantly written by uh, women of color, uh, gay writers, uh, books that address gender, and then books that address racism and civil rights. This is not just a matter of somebody not liking dirty words or thinking that something's inappropriate for somebody, for young people. These are ideas that these people do not like. And so they are trying to get them out of the schools. And once they are out of the schools, it becomes much, much more difficult for young people to read things that might give them a different sense of the world. And that's what education fu fundamentally is. It's not just about learning the facts that we need to know to get a job or go on to college. Education should really be about the process of allowing us to learn how to think for ourselves, to challenge our own ideas, perhaps, of what we've been told since we were children. And this very, very direct threat against books goes very much hand in hand with another issue I'm extremely concerned about, which is the uh, attempt to change how we teach history in this country and which history is acceptable to teach in this country. Maybe you've heard uh, uh, once again in Florida, the governor had announced that they would not allow uh, uh, an advanced placement class in African-American studies to be taught in Florida. Advanced placement classes are uh, classes that students are allowed to take and actually get college credit for once they pass a certain exam. Uh, perhaps in response to that, perhaps not the actually the, uh, the college board that pr produces the advanced placement class uh, changed its uh, requirements for that class and struck out a great many of the people who had been suggested to be taught in that class. They included people like Angela Davis or Bell Hooks, very prominent uh, 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 Black writers, thinkers, po political uh, analysts. Uh, Angela Davis, certainly uh, uh, ra radical in the 1960s, but expressing a point of view. Uh, Bell Hooks, uh, a, a feminist who wrote about the patriarchy, uh, nothing in it is uh, offensive or, or problematic. They just don't like these ideas, so they are going to suppress them. So these two things coming together, the way we teach history, erasing the fact that slavery and Black history are part of American history, alongside this, this, this very, very concerted attempt to remove books from school, and we're talking about hundreds of different titles being removed completely from schools, uh, is a very, very dangerous moment in our history. Uh, having written a book a few years ago called Strong Man, The Rise of Five Dictators and the Fall of Democracy, I know that dictators, autocrats, authoritarians, one of the first things they do is come for the books even before they come for uh, anyone else. That's why Hitler had the books burned. They come for the books to get rid of the ideas. After they come for the books, they sometimes come for the writers themselves. Um, one of the writers in great short books is uh, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was put in prison for writing a letter that made fun of Stalin. For that, he went to eight years into the gulag of hard labor wrote the book called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich about that experience. Uh, so this is a very, very dangerous moment because suppressing books, suppressing the way we teach history is part of what I call the strong man's playbook. And that's why it's such an urgent and dangerous moment for American democracy. American freedom of expression, American freedom of speech, and our very, very fundamental rights to 
allow our children to be taught to think for themselves. And to me, that's the most important thing that school can do. Um, I've talked for more than I wanted to. I think there is a lot more we can talk about and cover. I'd really uh, love to hear your thoughts, comments, and questions at this point. So Max, I'll let you take it away. Yes, thank you so much. That was excellent. Terrific. Um, I have some links that uh, Kenneth actually sent me that I'm going to put in the chat um, in just a moment. Um, some organizations that Kenneth um, has recommended that are fighting against censorship. Um, if you have any questions for Kenneth, please put them in the chat if you're watching on Zoom or if you're watching on Facebook. Um, Kenneth, I want to start the uh, Q&A with um, this idea of censorship and an idea of curatorship. It seems that there are some forms of what could be labeled censorship that we sort of all agree or accept as a society. You know, we don't find playboys in the elementary school library. We don't teach creation science textbooks in public school science classes here in the United States. These seem to be all so forms of maybe you could argue book censorship that we would maybe put under curatorship. So I want to know your thoughts on the lines between where is the line between censorship and curatorship in a public school library or in a public library? It's a really, really excellent question, Max. Thank you for that. And perhaps, I hope maybe uh, a, a, a librarian is out there who can uh, add their voice to, to my answer. Um, yes, there is in any collection, whether it's a library or what textbooks uh, students read, an element of selection, let's call it curation. Um, but librarians, as I understand it, and I speak to a great many librarians, both public uh, librarians uh, and school librarians, and there's a great difference between public librarians and school librarians, by the way, most people don't realize it. Uh, the school librarian is really uh, trained specifically to use her skills, his or her skills as a librarian to supplement what's going on in the classroom. It's not just about uh, having some nice books for the kids to read. It's really having materials that support the educational mission of the school. And that's very different from a public librarian's uh, mission. And the two groups are trained very differently, uh, as I understand it, for that reason. Public school librarians uh, are trained very, very specifically and uh, spend a great deal of time on this idea of collection building. What is appropriate for different ages? What is appropriate for uh, even different regions? And, and so, of course, yes, there's a, a degree of, of um, selectivity. And when you when when does selectivity become censorship? Um, that's a that's a fine line. And I, again, I hope uh, there's a librarian that might uh, speak to this more uh, articulately than I am. But uh, librarians spend a great deal. Public librarians, public school librarians, uh, spend a great deal of time reading, studying, monitoring the books that they are bringing into their schools. They are very much often driven by reviews, uh, reviews that are being made by people who have a degree of expertise in the field. Uh, and their their mission, I would say, is not just to have books that are fun to read and nice and everyone will enjoy, but books that do add to the educational mission of the school. And very often that mission includes uh, having books that will speak to the issues that students, young people, adolescents, or high schoolers are going through. And of course, that, as we all know right now, includes a lot of things that make some people uncomfortable, whether it's questions of, of, uh, uh, of, of gay issues or gender issues. Uh, these are the issues that these kids are dealing with. And so having appropriate, age-appropriate books that librarians have checked 
and gone through a process of selection to put into their hands um, is a really, really important idea. Um, there's a considerable amount of training that goes into it. I, I was surprised uh, to learn how long it takes to become a librarian in most states. And um, unfortunately, a lot of schools in a lot of places don't have fully trained school librarians. And um, that's to the detriment of the children's education. Um, so without really being able to, uh, to say what that process is that librarians go through, I'm going to say that my conversations with them, I know that they think about this a great deal. They spend a lot of time being trained to do this, and it's not something that they take lightly. The other thing I'll just throw in, it's a, a, a side point to that question, is that every librarian, every teacher I know that I've spoken to about this question will tell you that if a parent comes to them and says, I'm really not comfortable having my child read that book. They can always then be directed to read something else. The problem here is that we have parents and sometimes non-parents, just people with an agenda coming in and saying, I don't want that book in this school, making a decision for all, all of us. Um, so that's, a, to me, a much more dangerous question of, who's curating the collection than having a well-trained professional library librarian making that selection. When the crowd, the angry crowd at the school board meeting decides what children are going to read, what everyone's children can learn about and to learn how to think about, um, that to me is a very, very dangerous moment when we allow the voice of the mob to really determine our educational policies. So uh, I have a question from the chat. This is from Harvey Lippman. Uh, Harvey, thank you so much for the question. Again, I wanna reiterate if anyone else has any questions about anything Kenneth has said in this uh, presentation or any answers to his, uh, these questions, please put those in the chat. Um, Harvey's question is about um, the Wilson administration during World War I, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson and famously alien espionage and sedition acts. Um, and uh, the efforts during World War I to suppress speech. Um, could you comment a little bit about that history? And if there was any, you know, we're familiar with sort of uh, the famous Supreme Court cases involving, um, you know, Abrams v. U.S., Shank v. U.S., involving activist speech. But were there any attempts at book banning during World War I or during the Wilson administration that you're familiar with? Uh, really good question. Um, I have written a book about the World War I era in a slightly different perspective. Uh, the book was called More Deadly Than War, The Hidden History of the Spanish Flu in the First World War. It came out in 2018, the 100th anniversary of the influenza pandemic. Uh, I used to go to classrooms and wear a mask and all the kids would laugh. What is this crazy guy doing with a mask on? And they would all ask, well, could it happen again? And I generally would say to them, it's not a matter of if it will happen, it's a matter of when it will happen. And of course, two years later, we were in the midst of uh, the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And as a historian, very familiar with that era, I looked back and I said, we didn't learn anything from that period if we're talking about trying to learn from history, almost all of the important lessons of 1918 were either forgotten or completely ignored, very deliberately ignored. Um, so I bring that up because as a historian, I believe that we really do have to take the lessons of the past and, uh, and apply them to our, our, our current situation. And in the case of the pandemic, we did not do that. Um, it's interesting when you mention Wilson um, and, and this whole period, um, Wilson never spoke publicly about the influenza pandemic. Uh, the war was going on. That's what his concern was, making sure that there were enough troops and that the pressure was continued and the factories were running. So nothing was done on a federal level to counteract the most deadly pandemic in American history, 
uh, to that date. And, and numbers, because there were so many fewer Americans then, the numbers would have far, far outstripped um, what we experienced during COVID. Um, so about 675,000 Americans died in the um, uh, influenza pandemic, but the population was about a third of what it is today. Uh, so in other words, we could multiply that 675,000 by three to get an idea of what the Spanish flu would have done in modern times. The period um, the question is asking about is really the post-war period when the great fear set in. And this, of course, relates to another issue that's very much current, which is the issue of uh, immigration. Uh, the great fear at the time, partly inspired by the pandemic, by the, the influenza, and the belief that foreigners and immigrants were dirty and they would bring disease in, uh, really forced two things. We had the first real serious uh, clamp down of immigration policy in this country. And part of it was the pandemic, but part of it was also the politics uh, because so much of what was considered Bolshevism and socialism was coming from Eastern Europe. Those are the people who were really going to be excluded from this country. In addition, we did have the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, the 1920 version that it had been uh, uh, happened once before in American history during the uh, Adams administration. We had Alien and Sedition Acts, which were generally considered to be the, some of the worst pieces of legislation in American history. But um, this was a period where the um, great fear of communism, of socialism, coming after this dreadful moment in American history where 100,000 American soldiers had died in the war and 675,000 Americans had died in the flu. People wanted to go back to normal. And so they wanted to throw the wall up around the country. And that's part of what was going on. And it really led to a period of the uh, most severe, uh, the Red Scare in this country. And it went over into the uh, revival of the Ku Klux Klan in this country, because we think of the Ku Klux Klan as being uh, uh, about white supremacy, but they hated Jews and foreigners as, and Catholics just as much. So this was a period where America wanted to throw up the walls and keep out these people, which also meant keep out these ideas. So it wasn't a period so much of suppression of books in particular, and there wasn't the kind of book banning, but there was the arrest and jailing and deportation of people who were considered. Emma Goldman comes to mind, of course. Emma Goldman, uh, anarchist, socialist, uh, who is sent to uh, Soviet Russia. Um, so it was a period of tremendous fear a period where civil rights absolutely were destroyed. It's the period in which J. Edgar Hoover emerges eventually to take over what is going to become uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And its mission really in those early days was to suppress uh, any influence of, uh, of communism or socialism, the great red scare of the 1920s. Um, so we didn't have that sense of, of book censorship at that time, but more of a, 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 a more widespread fear of keeping out ideas that were dangerous. I hope that's a good answer to the question. It's a really interesting question. Um, so obscenity, the concept of obscenity has always been an exception to the First Amendment. So we know that there are some restrictions on the First Amendment freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And one of those exceptions has been this arguably nebulous concept of obscenity that is not so much enforced today, but as you mentioned with the Comstock laws was very much um, enforced historically and technically is still on the books today. Um, is obscenity ever a good argument to ban a book, especially in a public school or public library? Well, it gets back to the famous 
quotation, and we've, I'm sure we've all heard it, and I, I don't really remember which justice said it. Uh, I can't define obscenity, but I know it when I see it. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing perhaps there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough question. What's, what's obscene uh, to, a, uh, uh, to an adult? Uh, thinking of a child reading it is very different than what an adult might find obscene themselves. We, um, we are living in a time, first of all, let's be realistic that um, because of social media and the internet and the widespread availability of what was once, you know, you might pass around uh, a, a copy of Playboy, um, those those days are obviously long gone uh, in terms of what uh, anyone, children or otherwise, can see and uh, observe on the internet. So I think it's really changed the conversation uh, greatly. But we still feel somehow that a book is somehow different from that. And that's where you know, I, th I think it becomes more problematic. Um, and this is also where the question of the librarian's role as curator uh, becomes more important. Um, there are clearly books that are controversial right now. I'm not going to say that uh, the books, uh, all books should be allowed for all children because I don't, I don't believe that. But I do believe that librarians are uniquely suited and trained to determine what is appropriate for which age group. Uh, and what we would describe as truly obscenity, I, again, I, I don't know how you define it because, but I know it when I see it. Um, it would seem to strike me as highly unlikely that um, librarians at the middle grade, for instance, um, would be circulating books that we would consider obscene. Are they sexual? Yes. Are they graphically sexual in nature? Sometimes. Is that obscene or is that uh, a, a depiction of reality that's, um, that, that may be very, very uncomfortable for some people, but you know, books are supposed to, in addition to entertaining us and teaching us something, uh, are sometimes supposed to show us the truth. Um, I also think that there's this notion that um, that these books are somehow going to make these children into something, um, which I just think is an, an absurd idea. I read Treasure Island when I was 12. I didn't want to become a pirate. Um, and I'm not being, you know, I, I don't say that glibly, but I, I think that we under we have to understand that, you know, because we read something doesn't mean we are going to suddenly fall off a cliff and become something. Um, and that's the great fear that's underneath this. And once again, it's fear that people really don't like certain things because it, it goes against their belief system, what they've always learned to be true or real. Um, but that's what again, what education is in part supposed to do. It's supposed to show us a glimpse of the world that we may not be aware of. It may force us to challenge some of our easy assumptions uh, that we've grown up with. Um, I think that's a good and healthy thing um, for adolescents. Um, I'd be really surprised. And again, I, I wish if, if there were a librarian in the group to, uh, to answer this, uh, articulate what those criteria are I'm sure they are rules that change geographically. Um, what might be acceptable in a New York City public school might not be acceptable in a, a public school in Iowa. And, and that might be okay. But to just come in and say, take all of these books off the shelves, don't, which is happening right now as we speak in Florida and in Texas, um, that's a very, very different question than the question of a librarian making a, dis, a, a specific decision based on um, training and sensitivity. Yeah, um, excellent point. Um, a Supreme Court justice in one of the cases about obscenity, I think of uh, the Miller case, made the same argument that, um, you know, there was one case in the 1950s where they said that obscenity 
is defined by community standards and what are the purient, I can never say that word, uh, community standards. And uh, another one of the justices 20 years later in the 1970s during another obscenity case, well, what does that mean? Community standards, the community standards, I think he actually cited Maine and Mississippi are going to be uh, that much different than those in New York City or Los Angeles. So I um, just thought that was a relevant sort of historical anecdote. Um, I do uh, want to ask uh, one question from the chat, and this was sent uh, directly to me, so um, I'll read it. Uh, when should a community majority overrule a school librarian? Um, couldn't you have a school librarian with an agenda rather than a community member? Should the parents rely entirely on the training of the school li a school librarian? That's an interesting and, and good and fair question. Um, I think it's kind of sets up, first of all, the notion that the librarian is, you know, an alien interloper. Um, librarians are often, you know, members of the same community. Um, they often have children of their own in the in the community. So this notion that this there's this, you know, cabal of librarians and they've been attacked viciously in many places, uh, school librarians, many of them are leaving their jobs because they don't want, uh, they didn't buy into that when they decided to become a school librarian because they wanted to help children learn and uh, grow and develop. Um, so the notion that these are people with agendas, I think is a problematic starting point of the question. Uh, I think that most school librarians would tell you that their only agenda is making sure that they are providing materials that support the educational mission of the school. Uh, that sometimes includes books that might make some people uncomfortable. So if a, an entire community rose up and said, we don't want you mentioned the 1950s, the most uh, objectionable book in the 1950s and continues to this day is The Catcher in the Rye. If a whole community rose up and said, we don't want The Catcher in the Rye taught in our schools, um, I think that the, you know, the librarian might have to respond to that, or the librarian might make a very, very reasoned argument for why the Catcher in the Rye is a perfectly adequate and sensible book for adolescents to read because it's about the, uh, that moment in adolescence when you're just not sure of where you are in the world and you just don't trust adults. Um, and that's why The Catcher in the Rye is still read today because it, it speaks to that universal feeling that so many adolescents have. Um, I'm throwing that out as an example of a book that, um, has traditionally been among the most censored or banned or challenged books. And one of the links I gave you, I think, was for the uh, American Library Association's list of the most challenged and banned books. The um, American Library Association started Banned Books Week in 1982 because of that case that I had mentioned earlier on, the, the Island Trees case. They wanted to bring attention to the fact that serious good books, books we would now think of in some ways as classics, uh, Catcher in the Rye, To Kill a Mockingbird, have traditionally been uh, 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 among the most challenged because some people don't like those ideas. And might there be a dirty word in Catcher in the Rye? It'd be hard to find one in my recollection. But um, this is, and part of it is that, that certain books get a reputation and of course, a lot of these books people object to without ever actually opening them and reading them for themselves. So I think that's an interesting question that was posed. I don't think it's a realistic question in the sense that um, most communities, at least the communities that I'm reading about where these situations are, are arising, a lot of parents are pushing back because they don't want to be told that their children cannot read those books because uh, a, a large, but perhaps still minority, but a vocal minority, um, which is now very, very well organized, very well funded. And because of social media connections, um, 
what used to happen in Island Trees, New York, wouldn't have been replicated in uh, in Iowa or Texas. But now because of uh, social media and the ability to communicate, these um, networks are expanding and they have a very, very specific uh, political agenda, which um, goes far, in my opinion, goes far beyond just getting rid of some books that they think are objectionable. So I'm going to ask one last question, and it's kind of a two for one. Who, like uh, actual names of groups or organizations or activists that are trying to ban books? And what are some popular titles so we all know what to buy afterwards? What are some popular titles for books that are try that are popularly being banned now? Um, well, let's see. Uh, I have a list of a few of them. Um, first of all, I, let me just say that the the who part of that question, I don't have the names, but some of those links that I provided to you earlier, Maxwell, will include those names. There's also a, a story that just came up today from the New Yorker magazine about uh, the books being moved out of Florida. And it also, also identifies one of these groups. I can help you more with the question of which books are being uh, banned. Um, still books like Catcher in the Rye and To Kill a Mockingbird are being banned along with um, Harry Potter books. Um, Harry Potter books, a lot of people who are uh, evangelical or fundamental Christians feel that this is, you know, witchcraft and magic and Satanism, and they don't want their children exposed to it. Um, we, of course, would would kind of, to me, that's the kind of modern equivalent of taking Robin Hood out of the school because Robin Hood was a communist. Well, Harry Potter is a Satanist, I guess. Um, but no, the books that are under attack now, and I have a, uh, some of them, uh, tend to be, first of all, books that deal with sexuality, race, gender, uh, openly gay writers, uh, and trans uh, issues. Uh, so they deal with such books as The Hate You Give, really extremely popular, ex uh, successful book that is about uh, uh, somebody being shot by the police. Very, very obviously timely issue. Uh, Speak, uh, a book by Laurie Halsey Anderson, uh, which describes in, a, in essence her own experience as having been uh, sexually assaulted. Um, the book, this book is gay, uh, I think is the number one uh, uh, book being attacked right now. And I think probably just because of the title. Uh, and this one's a more of a bit of more of a surprise, but fits in with this. What I'm saying is that this is a, a war of ideas. Uh, the book Stamped, Ra Racism, Anti-Racism, and You by uh, Ibram X. Kendi and Jason Reynolds. Um, so this, you can see from this, and today I actually saw a reference to a book being pulled from a school in Florida about Roberto Clemente, the great a baseball player who died tragically in a plane accident. And I haven't been able to, to track this down yet, but um, uh, you know, why would that book be uh, pulled? Uh, the book, uh, The Diary of Anne Frank has been pulled in, in some of the Texas schools. Again, this, uh, there's this kind of, you might say, oh, that's a little too uncomfortable for my children to read about the Holocaust. Or is it really more, we don't want to talk about the Holocaust because we don't really think it happened? You know, is it Holocaust denial or a, a sensitivity about thinking that the, uh, talking about Anne Frank is too much to bear for, for young children, which is, of course, uh, nonsense as far as I'm concerned. It's one of the great books of 20th century literature. It wasn't written for young people sp specifically, but it's become... Uh, certainly a standard in, in most schools that you read uh, the diary of Anne Frank at some point to understand the personal human aspects of history and the most terrible moment in our history. So these are um, these are books now that make people a lot a lot of people really uncomfortable. And we're really in this time where uh, talking about our history makes some people uncomfortable. That's why I, you can't separate these two things as far as I'm concerned, because it's uh, they're, they're so pronounced uh, 
they're so organized and they are as far as I'm concerned so dangerous all right I lied one last question kind of off topic but what's the one history book everybody should read right now just one title but that you didn't write besides um don't oh know no I would, I'm, uh, <laughs> so what's 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 the one history book you didn't write that everyone should read gee that's that's a tough question I wasn't prepared for it um I I suppose um the the book right now that <laughs> that I think everyone should read is called on tyranny by Timothy Snyder uh 20 lessons for saving our democracy i don't know what the title subtitle is exactly uh timothy snyder is an excellent historian uh in fact uh i always can pull that he wrote this yes. book called, well, I, I was a russian minor so we uh, uh, floodlands your lands is a very well, great history book for anybody yes so, can recommend that uh, book. uh on tyranny is a lot more accessible it's 20 lessons uh about how to deal with uh autocracy and um and i i think that's a very important uh it's not truly a history book uh, uh in in that sense um but it's a it, it's a lot about history i think the um the other i'm sort of scrolling through my and looking at my own pile of books here the other book that's extraordinary and never loses its uh its value and timeliness uh is john hersey's hiroshima um his account of uh six survivors of the atomic bombing of august 1945 he goes to japan a year later and uh tries to tell the story from a, again from a human point of view of of what happened in uh uh with the dropping of the first atomic bomb it's a book that i think certainly counts as one of the most important books written in the 20th century excellent well kind of thank you so much thank you to everyone who attended um, again, please check out the First Amendment Museum's website for more speaker series that is coming up, always free, um, and more online programming and, and things of that nature. Um, thank you again to everybody. And can, you have one last thing? I just want to say thank you and thank you all. And, and this, uh, the museum is doing an important job. And I would just also suggest that anybody who, who's interested in more of these topics that I've raised, uh, my website is don'tknowmuch.com. That's all one word. And you'll find I write about history and what's going on in the headlines right now. Articles about book banning are up there right now with links to appropriate uh, other groups. So that, that's the best place to find out more about me and my work. Don'tknowmuch.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Have a good night. Thank everybody. you, Max. Good night.